Welcome to episode two of Confessions of a Cyber Psychologist. Today we are chatting to Linda Kay, Dr. Linda Kay, who is Associate Head of Psychology at Edge Hill University. Um, and Dr. Linda Kay will be talking about later, who is one of the founding members of the British Psychology Society Cyber Psychology section, and also the keynote speaker of, at the 2024 Cyber Psychology Conference, which we'll also be touching on. Welcome, Dr. Linda Kay, to Confessions of a Cyber Psychologist. We're delighted oh. to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to having a, having a bit of a chat. Excellent. It's always a delight chatting to you. Linda, we've, I just want to get a bit of background from you in terms of where you've come from and what that pivot point for you was in terms of this, your passion for cyber psychology. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, like a lot of people, I, I did an undergraduate psychology degree, which was just a normal sort of standard BSc um, route. Um, and I actually kind of fell into cyber psychology, really. It was when I started my PhD, um, which was just on the topic of uh, sort of the psychological um, experiences of video games broadly. Um, and it was from finding, trying to find conferences to go to that I then saw this term cyber psychology and thought, oh, that sounds exciting, <laughs> and realised there was actually a community that my research fit into, because um, I think a lot of people who do cyber psychology research tend to find that the university they might be studying it at, that they might be the one, one of the only people in their department who might be studying it and feel a little bit isolated. And um, so it's yeah. nice to kind of have a, a collection of people who uh, were doing things that, you know, were similar to me or at least in the same sort of field to me. So, yeah, it was very much falling into it. So the pivot for me was just finding my people, <laughs> uh, which is always nice um, and uh, recognising that there was a broader um, kind of field to, to what I was doing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's like finding your tribe, people who you can connect with on that deep level of passion. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's always lovely about the cyber psychology community is that it, it genu genuinely is a really supportive, friendly community. And we certainly experience that at our own conferences in the cyber psychology section. And we get a lot of really positive feedback on that. So it's it's really, really lovely to, to have a, a great community. Yeah. And especially because they um, throughout the UK to come together at something like a conference is, is an amazing thing. So. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like the, the, the thing to look forward to every year is, is, is the conference. And certainly it's, an, I know it's useful for me kind of making sure I get stuff done so I've got stuff I can present. So it's good to keep me on sort of time and track. So I've, I've got something exciting that is something new that is ready to share. So that's that's always good in terms of kind of managing projects and things <laughs> from that perspective. Exactly. In terms of the cyber psychology community, you were instrumental or part of the founding members of the British Psychology Society cyber psychology section. That's a lot to say in a mouthful. But... <laughs> yeah, we need an accurate, a better acronym, I think, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me about that. How did it start kind of getting to the point where you've actually um, launched this whole section? And that was in 2018. I think it was recognized and officially became a section. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, 2018 was it our official kind of birth, so to speak, um, as a section um, in the BPS. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, myself and it was Dr. Alison Abshaw Smith, um, Dr. Chris Fullwood, and Dr. Simon Bignell, who were the sort of four founding members, really, who sort of took this forward alongside a few other people who were part of a wider sort of steering group. Um, it, it came about as part of a roundtable discussion at one of the kind of previous conference series that a lot of us used to go to. Uh, the University of Wolverhampton used to do a lot of conferences and host a lot in their network there. So it was part of a, a roundtable discussion and there was this general uh, appreciation that um, it would be a useful thing to do. There were enough of us, enough interest, and why not have it recognised more officially as a sort of sub-discipline of psychology. So it was that really that stimulated um, the movement of that. Um, and then it involved a whole load of um, putting together proposals to the BPS and um, going to their research board and defending the proposal. And it, it got a lot of sort of support from the BPS. We didn't come under much opposition, which was great because we put a lot of effort and time into the proposal. Yeah. And then it just involved the, the official processes of the BPS, like member um, approvals and voting and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that was several years in the making. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really fantastic to see that it is now recognised and that it, the community just um, continues to be infused um, and, and to grow. And grow and grow and yeah. grow. <laughs> yeah, which <Yeah. laughs> is great. 
And then, um, so you a keynote speaker of this year's 2024 Cyber Psychology Conference. So tell us about that and what kind of generally, because it's the title you've got is what cyber psychology can tell about us about the digitally connected human experience. That sounds really exciting and fascinating. Oh, I, ho I hope it is. <laughs> On the day. Um, yeah, so you know, I was really, really um, but, um, really grateful to be invited actually to keynote at it. It was a lovely surprise to get in my inbox. Um, so um, yeah, the, the kind of idea was, I, I keep sort of using this term, dig digitally connected human experience. And I, I think there's something really intriguing about that as a term. And I kind of think, you know, it, it helps us recognise that that you know we as psychologists the human experience is a kind of essence really of what we're interested in yeah. um and actually what does that look like how is it different what are the, the kind of nuances of it when we are in a digitally connected world so it's it's trying to sort of do a bit more of a um a kind of bird's eye view i guess um of cyber psychology as as a whole i do i am intending to draw on very specific kind of insights from my own research because i think that's always just nice to be able to do and you know, I want to be able to talk about something I actually know about, which sounds good. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I thought it's, it's a keynote, it's a nice opportunity to kind of do that kind of um, sweep, I guess. And, and where are we up to and, and where, where do we want to go and what are the kind of interesting uh, things we could get even more curious about and what do we need to discover more? So it's sort of a bit of a kind of a checkpoint really for me as well. I, I, I always find doing things like keynotes are a great way of helping me consolidate my own thinking of, of what my thoughts are and, and that so it's it's useful for that as well. Absolutely and when is the conference? So the conference is taking place um, on the 1st and 2nd of July 2024 um, and uh, it's great for me this year because it's really local it's Liverpool it's being hosted at Liverpool John Moores University um, so, um, but we do have people all over you know, the country who come and attend it and also some international colleagues as well. Um, so yeah, the, the, the abstract deadline is actually still open. It's open until the, the 5th of um, April. Um, and actually I've just seen on the website um, that actually there is an extended deadline as well to the 12th of April. So if you've not quite got anything ready, you've got a little <laughs> bit of grace period there. <laughs> um, and then um, registration will then open thereafter. Okay. Um, so if someone wants to come along, do they have to be a cyber psychologist or can there be anyone who's just kind of fascinated and wants to know more? And if they do, how long do they have before they need to, or well, final registration ends? Yes, that's a good that? question. I mean, I'm, I'm always sort of, I think it's nice that, you know, anybody who's enthusiastic about cyber psychology can come. Anybody who isn't necessarily wanting to present anything, you know, the registration is open to not just to members of cyber psychology section, but much more broadly. So um, the deadline for registration is the 17th of June. So there's plenty of time to sort of be pondering whether you want to come along. In terms of if you wanted to present at it, then it, the, the submissions for abstracts do go through a review process and it has to sort of meet particular kind of criteria. So um, that will depend on that outcome of that review process but essentially anybody can register and attend uh, who might just have an interest we have had the members of the press come along to okay. conferences before and um, because they've seen something that has piqued their interest in terms of what you've done to kind of promote and and talk more about cyber psychology in general you've done a ted talk yes, <laughs> tell us about that yeah that, that was a while ago now that was in 2017 i think yeah um so yeah, that was that was a, a very random email to get. So it's that the email to it actually went to my junk folder, so I actually missed it <laughs> for ages. So it's a good job I had to do is get paid to check my junk folder. Um but it wasn't junk, it was it was genuine. Um yes, yeah, so that was um uh, that was the TEDx Vienna, um, which was uh, lovely because I went to the Volkswagen um Volt Theatre, um, which is a beautiful venue. Um and that was uh, all about the what what are emoji um I can't even remember the, uh, the title. <laughs> what do our emojis say about you? I think was it yes. the title. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, it is. What, what what can you tell about people's personality from their emoji use? Um, and that that was a really good experience. It was um, really exciting and um, something else I do, which is really nice about TEDx, is um, you have a general theme of the conference, but everybody's from very different disciplines. But you do become a bit like a family because you spend a few days with, with people, and um, it's really nice. Again, as another opportunity to talk about your your ideas and research to to wider audiences and people who might not necessarily know about cyber psychology. So it's it's great. 
have you done any more research on emojis or is that yeah so, so yeah so don't I, I'm doing a lot lot of research on emoji and actually the, the sort of focus of that has changed actually a little bit and evolved over time so the, the previous work and the, the work that I presented at TEDx um, was based on our research more about the sort of personality judgment angle on that on that's what can tell about people when we're in a social kind of interactional context and um, the more recent research and a lot of the program of research have got kind of mapped out now is more about um, how we process emoji and um, so it's a bit more kind of what the cognitive processes are when we're kind of on the emotion recognition of them and um, how do we kind of what, what's the sort of sensory and visual and, and those kind of processes so it's a lot more cognitive um, but it's it's really interesting and I'm, I'm, I'm delving into areas of the, um, the literature and different disciplines that I, I haven't done for a long time so it's really nice to to continue to learn and apply really interesting approaches and experimental paradigms and things to um to study this and it's, it's really intriguing to me that nobody's really done the kind of things I'm thinking about which seems a bit weird because they think quite obvious things <laughs> um, but well, maybe uh, unless I've missed something um, so yeah it's, it's kind of it, yeah. it's an exciting area to be in and exactly. um, what's really good is to because it's a lot of lab-based studies I can get um, students who are interested in cyber psychology involved and um, they can uh, work as paid research interns and actually learn about psychology um, and then support with collecting data and meeting participants and, and so it's useful for, for both myself and um, and my students yeah I think that's the great thing about cyber psychology is there's so many areas that haven't been studied and haven't been researched so to find to find something that you're passionate about and not find anyone anyone who's done it before is actually relatively easy compared to, gen to the general psychology fields and so for you studying emojis it's yeah it might just be that there just hasn't been enough people who are fascinated by it like you are Possibly. And I, I think the other thing is that, um, again, I think I'm kind of going to be reflecting a bit on this in my keynote talk, is that I think sometimes there's a lot of really useful theoretical um, and also areas of literature that exist that actually apply really closely to some of the things we're interested in cyber psychology. But actually, I don't think we're drawing on perhaps as much as we should do. So one of the um, particular limitations, I think, actually, generally, this is not sort of specific to specific researchers but as a general observation is I think we tend to sort of try and start things from scratch and think oh yeah we need a theory to explain this yeah. and so the theoretical foundations of a lot of cyber psychology is a bit weak and a bit shaky mm -hmm. um, but actually there's so many really useful frameworks in other related disciplines sometimes even in other areas of psychology that actually apply well I think they apply really well so if we use those we've got a much stronger foundation so I think that's the general observation and so I think it's the case that people who think of the kind of cyber psychology angle and um, have got these ideas but just haven't kind of made the connection with what kind of currently exists in other areas maybe that yeah. might, might be the, why there's areas that haven't quite fully been explored yet yeah absolutely just going back to your research so um in terms of your TEDx talk what you it sounds to me as though the research you did before was how people use emojis to express themselves and now it's about how people receive those emojis and how that then resonates with them psychologically and cognitively so is that fair to say yes yeah I think that's it so it's sort of shifted from what the um interpretations are about it in a social context yes and to more from a receiver's point of view how it actually is processed not sort of in a communication context but on a very kind of um on that kind of an automatic level so looking at you know is it a kind of implicit judgment process or is it more explicit so using different kind of measures to to, to answer that question yeah so and just kind of taking your research out of the academic realm how do you feel how do you think people who are not academics will be able to use your research and that your findings in a way that will benefit them. Do you think it's for teachers, therapists, parents? How, who do you think is going to really benefit most from what you're finding out? Yeah, well, I it, it, different ways, actually. I mean, I'm currently working with an organization um, called Feelalytics, um, and they're based over in the US, and they actually, um, I actually collaborate with um, somebody there, um, and they actually are interested in the research, and actually we've collaborated and published together because they use the insights 
on that to understand how we can use emoji or how different businesses can use emoji to understand net emotion index and, and sentiment of uh, remote working and uh, sort of well-being uh, and the well-being metric of organizations so actually being used in a sort of organizational sort of context which isn't uh, something i would never have really thought about um yeah. so again that's useful when people kind of approach you and can say i've got this particular thing and I think this could be relevant you think oh I'm glad you've made that connection because I haven't um so yeah. in that context I think um and I can see a lot of scope there so something else I'm sort of interested in at the moment is looking at um how we might experience emoji in terms of do we feel that we approach or withdraw so that again there's interesting frameworks in psychology about um, that idea of approach and withdrawal uh, from a kind of emotion point of view. So yeah. we're more drawn to positive emotion, more likely to inhibit a negative. So I'm kind of interested in that. So I think digital, from a digital marketing perspective, what's interesting is how that might relate to brand um, perception and um, likelihood of engagement. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's what I'm kind of thinking. So um, yeah, I think they could, they could, they can be kind of applied to those sorts of contexts as well. Yeah. So that's fascinating. So, so it's almost narrative psychology, but from an emoji perspective. I don't know what narrative psychology okay. is. <laughs> so it's, it's about the words we use to describe what we're going through and using different words that mean different things and how that then um, really gives a good indication of where we're at. Yes, I guess that's quite a nice summary, actually. Yeah. And I think what's What's interesting about emoji and what we have to be careful of is we tend to have this assumption that emoji are a universal language. And I, I tend to, would, would tend to disagree with that um, because we don't seem to, in, from one hand, we don't seem to process them emotion, emotionally on a kind of implicit level. So yeah. I think there is a kind of evaluation process that goes on. And what the implication of that is, is that we have different interpretations of the same emoji so that we have diverse ways that we label them and use them in different contexts so um when we so from a get kind of narrative psychology point of view i think it's interesting that we don't all share a narrative there that there are differences yeah. so yeah. yeah i think i think that that's sort of a really important caveat of this kind of emoji research right. so from a generational perspective do you think that there's a difference because older generations won't I suspect use emojis as much as younger generations and there's meaning attached to specific emojis that some people will understand and others won't. Is there this generational difference or is it more about a culture, a group context of what they talk about and how they speak? Yeah, I think I think it's a mixture of things. I, I don't think there are clear generational kind of distinctions. I think you sometimes see a bit of some kind of trends, um, but definitely it's sort of... Um, it, I think it's it's less about how much people use them, but the way they use them is maybe different. Um, and I, again, we see that when we look at sort of gender differences. Again, it's not the case that females use more emoji than men. It's more that use more likely to use them for emotional expression than men, and men are more likely to use them for um, other like punctuation or all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's that there are distinctions, not necessarily always very clear cut, but um, we do see trends about them being used in maybe different ways and and I think we also have to remember now this software is developed where we can have emoji as reactions to messages and again that's a sort of different way that we might use them younger generations might be more likely to make more use of those um, as a substitute to written comments and things like that so I think there's that there's kind of nuances on on that <laughs> never a clear answer is there so. <laughs> didn't give a yes or no to your question it was it depends <laughs> yeah that's that's generally the answer in psychology it depends it depends it always depends <laughs> there's caveats um because that's interesting though that there's now those reactions to a message because it kind of it tells someone that you've read it and you and you acknowledge it but actually you don't have to go to the effort of replying and thinking through what the answer ought to be without offending or saying the wrong thing yeah and it's it's really interesting there's there's actually a really kind of interesting sort of popular book called um I think it's called Metiquette, um, and it talks about what does a like actually mean and the different interpretations of that. Um, and I think that that's the same for things like like reactions. Is that sometimes it might just be an acknowledgement, sometimes it might be 
Um, and that could, in some cases, just be very abrupt and could be interpreted as being a bit yeah. rude. In other times, it might just be, yeah, I've just not had time to reply yet. I'm just saying I've seen it and I'm, I'm on it. So, yeah, I think there's, again, it's that, you know, is it really universal when we have all these different contexts that affect how we make a judgment about what that means and also that people interpret things differently anyway. So <laughs> Yeah. And that even that's fascinating, because even from, from my perspective, when I react to a text, I, I think people think the same as me with my reaction yeah and they probably they possibly yeah, don't and going that's rude <laughs> rather yeah. than oh she's seen it <laughs> yeah and I've, I've had this conversation before with somebody i think there's a again i'm not sure if it's been done or not but you know i think there's a really interesting theory of mind kind of piece there about how do you use emoji based on what your understanding of another person's appraisal is about how you're using it so and then there's an interesting sort of interaction that happens there and certainly another is research that looks at a kind of mirroring of emoji and, and I, I know just anecdotally I do that myself people who don't use them much I don't use them much with if I know somebody uses this kind of emoji a lot I might be more likely to use it so there's a really interesting interactional kind of thing that goes on there um, but yeah definitely there's something interesting about how we use them and interpret them based on our own kind of construct of what things mean <laughs> what that's just this is why I love cyber psychology there's so <laughs> many fascinating things you don't think about and suddenly you go oh <laughs> no it, it, actually this is a really nice um e example of why I really like doing these kind of things because I often am thinking out loud and I think you know verbalize things that yeah. either I've been kind of been pondering in there or things yeah. that I haven't thought about before and it's just prompted me to think that so it's yeah. really useful <laughs> <laughs> yay <laughs> brilliant and um, now during lockdown, I know that you did a, um, wrote a book. You may or may not be able to see this, but I'll put a link to it <laughs> in this chat. Oh, yeah. um, issues and debates in cyber psychology. So what started this whole process of writing this book on your own and getting it published? Um, well, first I was invited to write it, so that's always good. Um, and it came actually at a really good time. Well, two reasons for the time being actually in retrospect it was very useful and um, one is that I think I was at a point where I was thinking about a lot of different things in kind of isolation of each other and didn't have that opportunity to kind of bring them together and as I was sort of saying earlier again a good value for me for doing things like keynote talks is that it helps me do that bird's eye view of things and um, so actually it was really useful it was at a point where I thought I really need to piece these things together in my head and actually, for me, writing things really helps me do that. And um, I do find I, I, I think through things better when I write things out. Yes. Yeah. That might just be a bit odd, no, I don't know, but I, I just that's... find that really useful. <laughs> I get um, that. <laughs> okay, that's not just me. Yeah. Um, so it's, it seemed like a really good point in time to do it. Um, mm. And from a kind of career perspective, um, I had a chat with a few colleagues, senior colleagues, and they said, yeah, I think it's a good point in your career too be a, a named author on a book this you know it can, can be helpful um because I don't I don't know how familiar you are with working in academia but certainly for psychology sort of research papers rather than books tend to be kind of rated the kind of esteem uh, in higher esteem than books but but yeah it seemed like a good thing to do um, because of that um, and as well as that kind of looking back retrospectively it was just coincidence that you fell aligned with the time where we were experiencing a lot of lockdowns and honestly I think it was probably one of my saving graces <laughs> um, I th yeah I think a lot of people obviously experienced a lot of um, you know isolation and uh, you know all that kind of thing but it just it was a channel for me to just just kind of get you know <laughs> and articulate things and um, so I think kind of looking back it was kind of good that it happened during that time as well <laughs> yeah it's a fascinating book and um I've, I just thoroughly enjoyed reading I was like oh yes yeah. I didn't know that oh that's amazing so who is the who do you think is the right or the people who would be really interested in this book and go yeah you really need to read this is it people who are starting off in a, um in the undergrad or is it just a general knowledge book what what do you think is a a good type of person to pick it up yeah I, think, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think it, it kind of it applies quite it quite well to lots of different audiences. I think certainly it's it's one of the key texts on on the, one of the modules I do on cyber psychology, and I've actually now situated the module 
so it is more aligned to the kind of themes of the book so it, it yeah. speaks a bit more directly so that's also helpful for me and my teaching to kind of just of re, re, kind of um, review that um but actually i think my, my main reason for doing it was actually probably more targeted towards um media commentators journalists because yeah. often I, you know a lot of people who work in cyber psychology myself included get a lot of requests for comments on you know things that relate to popular debates yeah about things like screen time or social media well-being that kind of thing yeah. so actually having a book that situates the evidence around those sort of debates i thought was a helpful way of framing it rather yeah. than just there's a book on this and um, it's let's weigh up this and come to some kind of informed conclusion i need you so i think from that perspective that in my head a sort of thinking about future linda and um, this might rectify and give people the kind of answers that <laughs> um, yeah. might be useful um but yeah i think students but also general public um yeah. is accessible enough uh, for public audiences as well yeah, I, I think it's accessible enough for public audiences. It does, it's kind of quite an academic style of writing, but that's because you are an academic, so it's kind of, yeah, naturally. But it is, I think what's really great about it is it's very readable and very consumable by someone who doesn't have a background in academics or cyber psychology. Um, so it is, it's, and it's, a, it's not a long book. No, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, I, I, I don't think I could have written any more. So, yeah, no, I, I thought actually when I kind of saw the physical copy, I thought that's that's quite nice, actually. It's just a little... Digestible. Kind of so you can take it, yeah. So, <laughs> it worked out quite well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something that's easily read within a week um, over a few cups of coffee. And... Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and it's just still so rich with information. And just talking about journalists, because you said you said a lot of journalists contact academia. Do you find that often journalists or the mass media misrepresents the information that academics do find and do write about in the papers that they publish? Or do you think they generally are getting it sort of OK right? Things seem to be improving, I'd yeah. say. Um, sorry it's another it depends answer yeah <laughs> I, I worked with some very very good journalists who do who used to take a lot of time to speak with um experts who do their own research who do a really good job of representing um the kind of where the science is at um but i'm not saying that's always the case it does to some extent depend on the particular um news outlet they're representing <laughs> not yeah. to name anyone in particular and um, yeah. some I, I don't engage with and um, mm. because I don't agree with the, the way that they do journalism um, but the, certainly the people I've worked with have done a really good job at, mm. at, at being able to represent and um, I think there's often the kind of default mode is let's let's kind of panic a bit about these kind of things but actually I, I have seen an improvement in in but uh, to be honest, the, the, what can be represented in the media can only be based on the quality of the science that exists. Um, and I think part of the ongoing challenge we have in cyber psychology, um, and I know there are a lot of other scholars who experience this as well, is that we, we're constantly battling against ourselves, um, where we have very different sort of um, philosophical views about technology and when there's so much contrasting opinion perspective in the discipline itself and um, that really doesn't help journalists try and understand <laughs> where you've got yeah. these sort of very different views where do you find the kind of synergy of that and the kind of the, the, the agreed consensus points because there, there, there are very many so I, I, I actually don't blame journalists to be honest because it's a bit of a um, a bit of a, a mismatch of, of evidence yeah um, yeah so I think I think there's a learning point there about um what the discipline itself can do to support itself to then be represented better um, yeah. but there are there are a lot of tremendous efforts from um really good groups of research groups of people who are really trying to rectify that and i know you know colleagues um are involved in that kind of a really high level government level of informing policy and that it is the right people who are doing that who are doing the good science so that's always really encouraging and that kind of reassures me a bit yeah. That is encouraging for me too, because I uh, I often talk to cyber psychologists who are so frustrated at what's coming out of in in the mass media, the the clickbaits and the 
that, that it's all about getting or it seems to be all about getting eyeball attention um, rather than decent science. So it's so refreshing, so yeah. good to hear that that work's being done by great academics. And there are a lot of, or there are quite a lot of good academic, really great yeah. academics in science oh, yeah. They are, That's and, and they, they also do a lot of um, your work on the kind of public facing stuff. So um, one that comes to mind is the Oxford um, Internet Institute. And and mm. they, they I actually saw the other day, they were actually advertising for somebody to do the kind of public mass sort of media kind of facing stuff. So they're investing a lot of resource in um, in understanding why it's important to be disseminating the research and, and making it available in, in a format that's accessible. So that, that's really good to see there's a kind of investment there. That's amazing. Mm. Really, really good news. So you are researching emojis. Yeah. <laughs> what else are you researching? Is there anything else that you find really fascinating that you're diving into? Uh, a few of the bits and bobs. I think my, my problem has always been I'm a bit of a magpie. I just think, oh, that's exciting. I'll do that. And you end up there and being way, way too broad. Um, emoji stuff is always kind of very central and where the kind of very sort of rigorous academic stuff comes in. But I'm also um, interested in understanding social media behaviours a bit more. I've collaborated with colleagues at Aston University on this. Um, and we, we talk about social media use um, and that isn't, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> that can mean a lot of things. Um, so uh, yeah, we and then we sort of you know, people thought, well, you know, we can then talk about active use and passive use, and that still doesn't quite help me understand what that is. So yeah, it's looking more intricately at what the nature of different specific behaviours are that underpin use, and um, it's really interesting to me. Um, and I'd love to do more research to look at how that specific types of behaviours change over time and context. So doing some momentary sort of assessments that looks at the, the mood drivers or the context drivers about why we might do certain types of behaviour at different points in the day or whatever. Um, I think there's something interesting there. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to kind of scrutinise that a bit more and um, understand that because essentially as a psychologist, I'm interested in behaviour and I want to actually understand what those behaviours are um, <laughs> and what might be psychologically interesting there. So. Yeah. yeah, so they're doing stuff on that as well. Um, other things, my kind of more industry sort of kind of work, um, collaborating um, in a very early stage of getting proposals together on thinking about drivers of technology acceptance um, in, in industry, so how we can support technology diffusion and um, implementation. Um, so again, drawing on what we know from um, sort of technology integration models and that and technology acceptance literature there. I think there's some interesting work there to do as well, but that's in very, very early stages at the moment. Um, and you've also spoken about students who get involved with your research. So tell me about, more about that. If someone wants to um, know more about cyber psychology or get an undergrad with some experience in that, what what kind of things do you get students involved with that have given that experience? Yes, yeah, so at Edgefield in the Department of Psychology where I work, we, we have a really great um, paid research internship scheme. So that's where our second year students and those who are on our um, master's conversion course can apply to be basically a research assistant in the department to um, work with colleagues on live projects. Um, so over many years, um, and we'll continue to be doing this as, as, you know, as long as the funding is available to do it, which is looking like it might be next year, which is great, um, is to um, just advertise projects on um, the psychology emoji. And then, you know, I've always been able to um, engage um, students on those projects and they do a lot of really useful work to support my research, but also they learn about cyber psychology and psychology, how to do psychology research, and um, you know by practically doing it, uh, which is obviously useful from a learning perspective. Yeah. And um, so they can get involved in and actually the research itself in that way, um, and as a result, they then if we publish those papers, they then become co-authors because it's a, a valid contribution to the, the research, which is great from them as well. Um, and as well as that, certainly at Edge Hill, we have a, a final year optional module, which is one I run in cyber psychology. Um, and, you know, that's, it's a really cool module. I'm obviously very biased, but I always get loads of positive feedback <laughs> from it. Students seem to really enjoy the module and 
just helps them have really discussions and answer questions that they're interested in and um, and think about the applied nature of it and how it can translate into to all sorts of different contexts. So yeah, so, so those are the ways looking at age skills that um, people can get involved in in cyber psychology. So if a parent is watching this or one of the children and they're really fascinated with psychology and want to get involved in cyber psychology at some point, I think this is an area that they may be really interested in the future. How do they register for an undergrad and what kind of processes would they need to go through? Because it's um, the academic year is still about six months away. So how what are the processes? Is it too late to apply or do they need to still do other stuff? Yeah, so um, usually undergraduate recruitment, certainly at the edge hill, it might be different other universities go through the UCAS system, so it is too late for this coming academic year. So right. normally the UCAS deadline is usually end of January, right. or sometime in January. Um, so it will be too late for this ac coming academic year, but for um, September 2025 entry, I mean, we're already thinking about 25 entry with our perspectives and things, so it's not it's not too far in advance for me to be thinking about that. Um, then, yeah, it, it would be a case of the application window would be opening, um, sort of, I guess, from, you know, September to, to January um, this coming year. Um, so that would, that would be the time to be... Um, looking at options and, and applying. Um, is there anything else that you want to kind of chat about or that, that we haven't covered that you find completely fascinating about cyber psychology or someone who has, hasn't or really interested in cyber psychology or has no experience or understanding of it? Are there any things that you think actually they really need to know this? I think it's uh, what, what's useful is that there's a lot of really useful kind of accessible resources out there. I mean, something I did alongside my book were some like what I call cyber bites sort of videos, which sort yeah. of summarized with video summaries of each chapter. And um, I actually find that really useful actually on my cyber psychology module as well to kind of give a kind of a little bit of a, a trailer of, <laughs> um, of, the, of particular issues. Um, so it, it kind of works quite nicely as a companion resource to the book, but also those can be um, watched and, and and accessed just in isolation as well. So, and, and there's other kind of examples of resources about topics in cyber psychology. You've got things like pieces for the conversation that colleagues have written on topics related to that. Those are really good. They're designed specifically for public audiences. Um, that kind of digest some of the, the issues and give a, an, an accessible summary of the kind of scientific evidence. And I think things like that, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of those that exist. Um, and there are some, as far as I'm aware, still some resources on BPS cyber psychology section website as well. So, um, yeah. and on there, actually, what's really good is the BPS have actually been doing um, a series of careers in cyber psychology, which I know you'll know about because you've done one for us, which is amazing. Um, and those are really, really useful um, to give insights into how cyber psychology is applied in different types of careers. And again, I think you're a really good example of that. It's the kind of thing I wouldn't, again, naturally think about where cyber psychology fits, but obviously does really well. Um, so those are really good as well, the careers in cyber psychology series that um, our colleague on the committee, John Blythe, has done a fantastic job at, um, at consolidating. <laughs> yes. And one final question, what is your favourite cyber psychology book? Oh, there are, there are a lot of really good resources out there. Um, I think one of my, my favourite ones um, is possibly the Introduction to Cyber Psychology uh, resource um, that was published um, or edited by colleagues at IADT over in Dunleary. Uh, they've just released the second edition and it's on my yes. bookshelf, which I can uh, now get today. Yes, so, get it. There <laughs> <laughs> it is. Oh, and it's, and it's actually, this one's a, a BPS core textbook series as well, oh. which is even, even better. Um, but this one's great. This is really comprehensive. Um, I find it useful. Um, again, to recommend to students. It's mm -hmm. very sort of accessible in terms of, it breaks down a lot of the sort of very typical content areas in cyber psychology. So would, I would always say that one's, that one's a really good one. Um, and I, I do have a lot of, of uh, fondness for that as well, because um, I was invited to write a forward for that one. And I, I, I originally launched the book on its first edition back over in Ireland. So that was always really nice. And you know, the colleagues over there are really lovely and friendly. And um, yeah, so that one's, that one's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> 
And in terms of that book, how is it different to the first edition? Is it are there new topics, or is it just updated research? It's a bit of a mixture. So it's in broadly the just sort of updates. And um, there are a couple of newer new topics in there. I can't remember now off the top of my head what they That's are, but there definitely were some new sections in it. Um, but yes, it's it, there is a progression from from the first one in terms of it, it has been updated because obviously that you know the nature of cyber psychology is you know the research moves quite fast. So these things do need to be updated uh, quite regularly. So um, yeah, excellent. Because I've bought the first one. So I'm like, oh, do I need to? Yes, I do need to buy the second one. Possibly. I'll, I'll double check which the topics are. Is. <laughs> I think I need to anyway, because it's just always fascinating to get updated research, because as you That's say, it. it moves on so quickly and yeah. there's always new technology coming up. And so therefore new behaviors that we display and us, the way that we engage with technology changes over time as well. Yeah. And a cultural shift changes. So it's you really do need to keep up to date with cyber psychology information. Yeah. It's not just... You know it, therefore done. Slightly yeah. different things like child development, for example, because there's, yes, there's new research, but it's not as fast paced, which yeah. is one of the exciting things about cyber psychology. This is interesting. Yeah, no, this is exciting. Sometimes I just think, you know, I, just, I need about five of me to be able to study all the things <laughs> I'm interested in and keep up to the pace, um, which again is part of the problem, I think, of be, being quite broad in the kind of things I'm interested in, because then you just, it's very difficult to keep track <laughs> of all of all the different advancements in this like the, and even though they're still all within the same field that is it's quite yeah. a, like a task to do so again needs I, I, yeah that's a lesson to me to be a bit more focused <laughs> yeah brilliant linda it's been a delight and a joy chatting to you as it always is oh, and um <laughs> and all the best with your prepara preparation for the cyber psychology conference and um yeah, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for joining us at episode two of Confessions of a Cyber Psychologist.